Amen. I have to encourage you. If you ever having a bad day, think about Psalm 27 and see if that doesn't change your perspective on some things. Here are the words of David when he talks about how the enemy came to eat upon his flesh. They stumbled and they fell. Listen to what the king is saying to you about how good and faithful our God really is. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's look. Let's receive our scripture this morning for our sermon. Amen. It comes from 1 Samuel chapter 17, verses 51. C through 50, verse 58. Amen. Uh, if you have it in your Bibles, would you sit the Bible standing to your feet? If you don't have your Bibles, don't worry, we have it on the board. Amen. I want, I know someone is looking in your Bible for verse 51 C. You're saying to yourself, I do not see a verse 51 C. Yes, you do. Uh, in the Bible, whenever a verse has more than one sentence, complete sentence in it, each verse is, is given a alph alphabetical uh, designation. So if you have a verse with eight uh, 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 sentences in it, the first verse is A, second verse B, C, so on. So uh, we're picking up with the third sentence in verse 51. Amen. Reading from the New Living Translation, it reads as follows. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah gave a great shout of triumph and rushed after the Philistines, chasing them as far as Gom and the gates of Ekron. The bodies of the dead and wounded Philistines were strong all along the road from Shiraim as far as Gath and Ekron. Then the Israelite army returned and plundered the deserted Philistine camp. David took the Philistines' head to Jerusalem, but he stored the man's armor in his own tent. As Saul watched David go out to fight the Philistine, he asked Abner, the commander of his army, Abner, whose son is this young man? I really don't know, Abner declared. Well, find out who he is, the king told him. As soon as David returned from killing Goliath, Abner brought him to Saul with the Philistine's head still in his hand. Tell me about your father, young Saul said, and David replied, his name is Jesse, and we live in Bethlehem. Thus far, the word of God, you may be seated in the presence of God. Amen. Our title of our sermon this morning is Destroying Fear, Igniting Faith, Part 5. Destroying Fear, Igniting Faith, Part 5. Now, yes, I know, I can hear you what you're thinking. Pastor, why are we still in this sermon series? Didn't last week David slay Goliath? Didn't he kill the Philistine that was talking all that mad trash to, to the Israelites? Didn't he bring all this to an end? What's the purpose of still being here? Well, guess what? If we look at 1 Samuel chapter 17, what we notice is that 1 Samuel chapter 17 has 58 verses and not 51. That if the story was simply about David killing Goliath, then the end of the chapter would occur at the end of verse 51. But what we see, there's still seven more verses. Uh, yes, yeah, seven more verses left to this chapter. And what that means, there's still something left in the story. And it says there's still something left in the story, there's still meat on the bone for us to get. You know, the problem is many times we get to the place where we're satiated and then we think we've had enough so we don't go any further. But here's the thing. To get what God has, you have to go to the end of the story with God. It's not good enough to celebrate Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead. It's not good enough celebrating Jesus feeding the thousands of people with a little bit of cornbread and fried catfish. It's not good enough to celebrate Jesus because he has the ability to turn water into booms fun, into, uh, into different types of uh, wine that we like to drink. At some point, you have to go to the end of the story. In fact, you can't even stop at the cross. Many of us like to stop at the cross, but we say he kills sin, he destroys sin, he nailed it. But the true story, the true end, is when God raises him from the dead and gives him the power, the keys to heaven and earth, and, and puts all power in his hand. If you are going to know to do anything with 
God, to study the thing, to be the new God. You've got to go to Him. This is also why God doesn't let you celebrate your last victory as, as if your last victory was a be all, end all of your life. That when you wake up, there's always a Monday morning. In fact, guess what? We won't go to bed tonight in the world, well, and guess what? There's going to be a new Monday tomorrow. And when that new Monday comes, guess what? You will have new devils, you will have new troubles, you will have new messes, you will have new issues. There's no need to, to, to be here talking about God. You killed them by Friday last week. Well, guess what? There's a new set this week. And it's imperative that you understand that what God did last week is not the end all be all. That if you would just hang on and trust God, God will show you something new by Friday or Saturday this week. Amen? Amen. So I'm uh, preaching like, okay, maybe we'll give you the credit. Amen. Praise God. In our story here, good David has met Goliath face to faith, that David as the, uh, as the example of faith has gone against the example of fear, and David has won. David has taken his slingshot, the same slingshot he used while he shepherded his father's sheep, and he took, put a, a smooth stone in there, he put it in his slingshot, he wound his slingshot, and he gave a slingshot and yanked, sending the stone to hit a Goliath dead in his forehead. Remember last what we said that we're not sure if the rock killed uh, the Goliath, uh, the fact that we're going to operate under the assumption that it just simply knocked him out, but that but David realized that if you're going to deal with a giant, if you're going to kill a giant, you got to kill a giant. That you just can't mortally wound a giant and hope that the giant dies later. That you got to at some point take a sword, even if it's not yours, take his sword. And you got to cut that joker's head off so that that joker cannot come back and bother you or bother your people ever again. Do you know that many of the problems we're dealing with because no one has taken the time to actually kill the devils in our lives? We, in fact, we got so happy that we wounded the devil. We got so happy that we hurt the devil that we started celebrating about his broken limb, his cut his, cut, his thumb toe and his cut finger. But what God wants us to do is to kill some devils. In fact, there's a story in the Old Testament where a prophet walks up to the king and he says, How many? And he says, Take the arrows out of your uh, quiver and beat them on the ground. And so the king, worried that if he used all his arrows, he would have nothing to protect himself, only took a few arrows out of his quiver and beat them on the ground. The prophet said to the king, You know what? You should have listened to the man of God. Because the man of God will sit here to show you something. That had you been obedient to God and taken all your arrows out and smashed them on the ground, you would have no enemy because your arrow, the arrows were represent your enemies. But because you want to break all your arrows, you're going to still face some enemies this day. What is God saying to us right now? God is saying to us that if you want to defeat some enemies, if you want to break free of some strongholds, if you want to move some devils and some demons out of your life, then it's imperative that you move them all out of their life, out of your life. That it's not good enough that you just move them over to the corner and move them across the street. You need to move them completely out of your life. And so David has removed Goliath from the scene. He's removed the threat that Goliath is from the scene. But what these verses tell us is there's still a Philistine army. David only killed one man. The whole thing about Goliath is Goliath was a giant of giants. If these folks stood an average of seven feet tall, Goliath stood an average of nine to ten feet tall, but they were still giants. And the, these giants are still head and shoulders taller than the Israelites. Just because David killed Goliath didn't mean that the threat was gone. Do you know that given the right amount of time, a new champion would have arisen out of the Philistine army? That a new champion, and guess what? This champion didn't have to operate out of fear. This champion could have operated out of us, of your and my low self-esteem, of your and my low self-worth. Whatever this champion was, he was coming. And if Israel did not deal with the Philistine army, then guess what? They only postponed the threat that the Philistine army represented. And I want us to know today as we sit here, just because you dealt with your mind, Amen. Your cheating, your scheming does not mean you dealt with the other issues and sins in your life. Your, your, your lack of trusting God. Your, your, your lack of, uh, uh, of being loving. Your lack of uh, being caring for your, your neighbor. Whatever your shortcoming is, if you have not dealt with them all, then all you've done, you postponed 
the inevitable of, the, of them coming back and them harming you and getting you. So what happens here, we see something happen here. David kills Goliath, but there's still the Philistine uh, army there. And it's looking around and it sees that his champion has fallen. And you know what they do? They all get intimidated. They all get scared. They turn around. In fact, I, I can, can you just hear what they say? Oh my God, did you see that? Did you see that boy come out on the field and slay and knock Goliath down? Did you see that boy pick up Goliath's sword and cut his head off? That's what a boy did. Imagine what these grown men are going to do to us. We better get out of here. And they turn and ran. In fact, that brings us to our first point of our sermon here today. Amen. Even the first point. Amen. Fear as well as all that, as well as our other spiritual enemy, aren't the cohesive whole that we believe them to be. That here's the thing. As long as Goliath was out front running his mouth challenging the Israelites, the Israelites thought that the Philistine army was to be feared. Okay, y'all miss that. As long as Goliath was there, as long as the biggest, the baddest, the loudest, the strongest one was in front running his mouth, everyone else looked fearful. It's not. If you take out the one that's talking the most trash, everyone else leaves you alone. You know how I know? Because guess what? Life, life is such that when you beat up the biggest and the baddest one, everyone else leaves you alone. Because they're like, wait a second, he did that to the best of us. What is he going to do to us? Haven't you noticed that the bullies left you alone when you finally got mad with the biggest bully and you say, you can beat me up every day, you can take my food, you can take my lunch money every day, but guess what? You ain't going to keep bothering me. And all of a sudden, the other bullies left you alone, the other bullies went and fought with someone else because they said if he's crazy enough to fight him and he's the biggest bully in the schoolyard, he ain't afraid of us. They're not, your enemies are not as together as you think they are. I know they look like it because they're all coming at you one time. But what happened, your enemies are sitting here hoping and praying that this big issue over there stays. Because guess what? This big issue is what we call the gateway issue. You know what a gateway is? When you talk about gateways, don't you? you talk about gateway drugs, gateway shopping, gateway spending, gateway this. What it means, gateway, we use gateway in that way we're saying that is the door upon which other things come through. And that every one of us has a gateway issue. Amen, I'm gonna be honest with, me, honest with you. Amen, when I look at this belly and that, 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 uh, that scale in the bathroom, I keep cussing out the doggone peanut butter cookies. Because every time I eat one cookie, it opens the door for another cookie, and then another piece of junk food, and some ice cream, and everything. Them doggone peanut butter cookies. You know that's not what I want to say to my peanut butter cookies. You know I want to cuss them out, because I can't cuss them out right now. So use your spiritual imagination about what I'm saying when I'm on that scale looking down at it. Those cookies act like a gateway to everything else I should not be eating. But they call me. <laughs> they call me, y'all. There it is. Okay. I'm in the middle of the night, too. I'm asleep. And I can hear him down saying, hey. <laughs> <laughs> We're all alone. Why don't you come visit us? Spend a little time with us. And sure enough, by the time I know, I'm gone through a little box of cookies. Amen. Praise God. Our enemies are that way. Guess what? Your low self-esteem doesn't bother you until something else makes you afraid of what someone else thinks about you. Come on now, tell the truth. You're doing good until you run to that one person that you think looks better than you. Your fear of being looking second best then had you now having a little self-esteem about what you have, and what you have may cost more and look better than what another person has. Come on, tell the truth, somebody. I remember my aunt, my great aunt, my grandmother's uh, uh, sister-in-law told this story about my aunt and her first cousin, Auntie Jen, and her first cousin, Mildred. They are children of two sisters, amen. And so when Auntie Jen was a little girl, they, they, you know, on the farm, you tend to have your babies at the same time. So Auntie Jen had her sibling, her cousin sibling, Mildred. Uncle Shorty had his cousin sibling, Walt. I don't know who, oh, the brother is my mother's cousin sibling. They all had babies at the same time growing up on the farm. 
And so uh, Auntie Jan and Cousin Mil Mildred were sitting at the feet of Aunt Lily. And Aunt Lily said to them, so what do you want to be when you grow up? So uh, Aunt Mildred they were saying, I'm going to be a, a movie star, a glamorous movie star. I'm going to be this, I'm going to be that, this and that. So she said, well, Jan, what do you want to be? She said, I want to be just like Mildred. Yeah. Oh. Because of our self-esteem, we want to be like that. But guess what? The, it, the self-esteem only works when fear is in place. But I dare to say fear is really the gateway for many of our issues. I fear that he's going to leave me, so I go do this. I fear that she's cheating on me, so I go do this. I fear that I won't have enough, so I go steal. I fear that they won't believe me, so I go lie. I fear, I fear, I fear that all these other sins come to the door. But if we can just destroy some fear, y'all, these other sins will so, so have a leg to stand on. In fact, it becomes easy to defeat these other sins when we destroy fear. This is why it's so important that we stamp out fear in whatever shape, form, or fashion that we see even lesser fears. Y'all, y'all do know that a constant attack of multiple fears is just as damaging to us as one big attack of a, of a big fear. Okay? Let me let me mess with parents right now. I see we got several parents in here. We parents tend to fear for our babies. Amen. 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 Come on, tell the truth. Shame the devil, y'all. We fear when we drop them off at daycare. We walk out and first we say, God, please don't let anything happen to them at the daycare. We don't want the people at the daycare to hurt them. Then when they go with friends to the movies and out to eat and hang out, please don't let anything happen at the friend at the friend's house. Uh, amen. My my oldest one is on a missionary trip right now. Her mother is so scared about something happens. I stop. You know, stop speaking it into the universe. Have faith and trust and believe that the same God that protects her when she's here in the States and away from us is the same God that's going to protect her when she's on her missionary trip. But these little bitty fears. I love my dad to death, but everything was a fear for him. Like, okay, you make sure you call me. You make sure you get in here. All these little fears can wear you out just like a big fear, a big gigantic fear. And here's the thing. Many times we think that because we beat the big gigantic fear, that the little fears are easy. No, the little fears are still there. And if you don't watch out, if you let them get together, they're going to be like one big fear. So we got to step out the little fears as well as the big fears. And as we're stepping them out, what we'll notice is our enemies will start to scatter. They'll start to run. They don't want to face you after you defeated their biggest and strongest ally. They want to run from you. They'd rather deal with someone else than to deal with you. Amen. Give me my second point. Amen. Praise God. Other people are able to conquer the fears they face in their lives by observing us model faith in our lives. Now check this out. When 1 Samuel chapter 17 begins, recall, Goliath and the Philistine army would come out to the valley. He would make his challenge. The Israelites would get scared, turn, run away, run and hide in their tents. All right? That's the beginning of the story. They said this happened for 40 days and for 40 nights. Well, guess what? By the end of the story, though, the Philistines are afraid of the Israelites, and they're running away from the Israelites who are chasing them, wanting to put them to death. Y'all saw that? Y'all saw, saw the change? At the beginning of the story, the Israelites are scared of the Philistines. By the end of the story, there's the Philistines scared of the Israelites. I say to you, the, what the change that happened is that those grown behind Israelite men saw what a child was able to do, and they were convicted. They said to themselves, if God could bless a child to overcome our greatest enemies, what is our issue? What is holding us up? What is stopping us from being the people that we need to be? In fact, what happened, David is not only demonstrates faith, but he creates a model of faith upon which other people can use too. Are y'all not kidding me? Amen. So let me help you. I'm going to pick on Brother Ferris. Can I pick on you, Brother Ferris? Amen. Brother Ferris called me uh, this week. Amen. And I was, I was, it, it was Wednesday, it wasn't it? It was Wednesday. Yeah, amen. So between Bible study, uh, amen, being encouraged by Brother uh, Rose, and then having to go to the hospital, I kept saying, he wanted me. I said, I'm calling you. I forgot about you. So I finally got a chance to call him on the way home. He was telling me about something that happened in his life. And the question he asked him, and he says, why must I continue to keep having to deal with this foolishness in my life? Why, God, I had enough of it. I don't want to deal with it anymore. Put this on somebody else. And I had to uh, speak to him 
from experience, my own experience, and let Brother Ferris know that guess what? The enemy never ever stops messing with you because guess what? God allows him to mess with you so that someone else can see how to handle the enemy. That you are the model. Amen. You're the one that said God use me. You're the one that said God bless me. You're the one that said God I'm here to be used by you. And so guess what God says? says Alright, let me see you right into a storm. You want to know why? Because guess what? We can tell people to go read a Bible. We can tell people to memorize scripture. We can tell white people to come to church all we want to. But what they learn about faith is what we demonstrate, what we model before them. And what they, God wants people to see is how to walk by faith. There's a reason why God Jesus kept sending the knucklehead disciples onto the water. Because eventually the day was coming where he wanted them not to only get comfortable being in the storm, but walking on some water. And guess what? What God wants people to see is how to walk on water. Because if you're walking on top of water in the midst of a storm, what you're saying is that the storm, nothing about the storm can touch you, nothing about the storm can hurt you, nothing about the storm can harm you. In fact, what you do, you cause people to reach out and say, how are you able to walk on the top of the storm? That's when you're able to say, because I keep my eyes on Jesus. Jesus beckons me to come out of the water. So I get out on the water and I walk toward Jesus and I trust Jesus and I'm not worried about the storms. In fact, or the waves. In fact, what I do, I walk from wave top to wave top. In fact, I never walk down into the water because I am trusting Jesus. That's why God had you going through something. That's why it seems like you are always in the midst of something. It's not because you've done something wrong. It's not because you have fallen short of the glory. It's not because God loves you any less. In fact, what you should be doing is pat yourself on the back. In fact, do this. Turn to your neighbor give him a high five. Right, come on. Go give him a high five. Give him a high five. Now, you know why you're giving him a high five? That's because God has said you are worthy, you are trustworthy, and you are dependable. That I can send you into a storm. I can send you into a mess. I can send you into a predicament, and you won't falter. You won't fail. You won't get scared. In fact, instead, you're going to declare my name in the midst of it. You're going to let people know that I am alive and I am all powerful, and that what they're going to do, they're going to find themselves following you as you follow me. You are the model. You are the model. You got to get past this whole idea that something is wrong with you. There ain't nothing wrong with you. Brother Rose told us Wednesday at Bible study, it's already done. God has already saved us. So if we are to say, why are we tripping about, is he going to save us? Why are we acting like the disciples? Wake up, Jesus. Don't you care about it? Yes, he cared about you. He died on the cross. Now what he wants you to do is take that power and use that power to help someone else be saved by Jesus. You know, they, 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 it's not a compliment when you keep Jesus to yourself. Jesus is to be shared. This ain't like your money. Come on, tell the truth, share the devil. I don't see him in here. One weekend, brother, uh, remember and I were supposed to go to have dinner with a couple pastors with other pastors, council bars. So brother said, I'll see you tomorrow. I said, well, he's not going to take your pastor to dinner? You know, he said, he said, nope, I'm going to see you tomorrow. Bye. <laughs> I know he's running, running around in the back. I hear him here, I'm messing with him. Amen. But here's the thing, Jesus is to be shared. He's to be, he's to be given away. Because guess what? You can't ever give Jesus away from you. Because we belong to Jesus. And since we belong to Jesus, giving him to someone else doesn't give him away. In fact, what happens, that brings the other person into relationship with us. Give me a third point. Amen. Praise God. Our victories over fear are both a trophy and a reminder of how the Lord has enabled us to overcome the predicaments we encounter during our faith walks. This past Monday, the University of Virginia won the National Collegiate Men's Basketball Championship. They went through the 64, uh, this March Madness. They were the surviving team out of 64 teams. At the end of the day, and they're national champions. And if you watch the game and watch the proceedings afterwards, the president, president of the NCAA the, uh, uh, presented the coach, head coach, first he presented the school president with the championship trophy. The school president then gave the trophy to the head coach. The head coach hugged it, kissed it. Ooh, this is a 
wonderful. You know how all coaches do. Amen. It is. And you get to the assistant coach. They carry on. Oh, this is so wonderful. This is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen in my life. You see the wife looking at their, their husband's like, really? This is the most beautiful thing you've ever seen? Then the head coaches, the assistant coaches gave it to the basketball players. The basketball players are hugging and kissing. I've never experienced anything like this in my life. They're all crying and all happy. And I looked at them and I said, here's the funny thing. All of that, much they're carrying on about that trophy, can none of them take it home? Amen. If you want to see that trophy, you have to go to the University of Virginia, to a specific building, sign yourself in, be under the cameras, a million and one cameras, and they're going to let you see it from behind the glass. You ain't, if you want to kiss anything, kiss the glass. They ain't going to let you hold it and kiss the trophy. Now, how are these young men going to remember that they are champions? How are these young men going to remember that they did something that no other team did in the 2018-2019 basketball season? You know how they're going to remember it? Because the NCAA is going to buy them championship rings. More than likely, these are going to be gold, diamond-encrusted rings that they can wear on their fingers. And many of them will wear them everywhere they go. When they go to church, they're going to have them on. When they go to class, they're going to have them on. When they go to the beach, they're going to have them on. When they go to the movies, they're going to have them on. When you sit there and talk to them, they're going to be talking and just coming <laughs> so you can see their national championship. I know I would if you work that hard for it. Amen. And, and, and in fact, every sport has a championship ring. And they give rings to the to the, to the victors so that they will have both a trophy and a reminder of what they accomplished. Now here's the thing. David had a trophy too. David did 2,000 years ago, more than 2,000 years ago, what Virginia is going to do later on this year when they finally receive their championship ring. David took a trophy. And the trophy was Goliath's armor. They said he carried uh, uh, Goliath's head, but his Goliath's head was put downtown. That's the big trophy. That's the championship trophy. That was put downtown so you could see this. You could come by the temple or wherever this head was so you could see the victory of the Lord. However, when you came to David's tent, when you came to David's house, when you walked in, the first thing you saw was Goliath's armor sitting on a mannequin. And you know why that was? One, that was to remind David of the victory God gave him. That any time David felt down, any time David felt as if things were going well for him, all he had to do was look at that, that uh, suit of armor, sitting over there in the corner, remember that the same God that blessed him when he was in the field with his father's sheep is the same God that gave him victory over the giant Goliath. And if he trusts God, it would be the same God that gave him a new victory. But not only that, but guess what? David had guests coming to his house. You know what we do. We invite people over to dinner. We fix the good food. We bring out the good silverware and the good china. We bring out the good wine that we've been saving. You know the $10 bottle, not the two-buck chuck. We bring out the $10 bottle, and we put it on the table, and we give people, what do y'all have to get on drink? Wait a second. I saw three of y'all at the club last night. Another four when I walked out in line trying to get in. Amen. Praise God. <laughs> uh, but you know, you bring out the good stuff, and what happens when the people come in, when they come to the front door, you usually put your, your trophies where people can see them. You know, as we get older, we call that art. You know what I'm saying? We put our best art where people see it, our best sculpture, our trophies, so that when people walk in, they realize they're not in the house of just anyone. They're in the house of someone special, someone that has ability, someone that has the, the, the knowledge of uh, 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 the wherewithal. So when people came into David's tent or in his house, the first thing they saw was the armor. That was let them know David was nothing to play with. That you can joke around, fool around with David if you want to, but please understand, David is a giant killer. And if he's a giant killer, you're behind him nothing. And so, and so many times, uh, David will keep it right there. What am I saying to you? That here, that we, none of us have championship rings. Or do you? Amen. Praise God. Amen. None of us have championship rings. None of us have any armor from our enemies that we beat in. But we've had our testimonies. 
We've got our witnesses. Those are the trophies, God. You're found. Look, how many people got some scars? I know I got scarred because I was a daredevil as a child. It seemed like every weekend we spent the weekend by Saturday evening in the emergency room, fixing up something, repairing something, and what happened, my scar, amen, praise God, my scars became testimonies about what I lived through, the broken bones, the busted ligaments, the surgeries to repair things. My scars remind me that God was faithful to me, that when I thought I had killed myself, God saved me. God stopped me from hurting myself. Your scars are the same thing. I know that he broke your heart. I know that she took everything away from you and left you with nothing. But that scar is a trophy and a reminder that when your enemy tried to kill you, when your enemy tried to hurt you, when your enemy used that person to totally decimate you, that God kept you. And that the only thing you got from that whole experience is a scar that you're still here, that you're still breathing, that you're still watching. You remember that person said, you ain't gonna be nothing without me? Well, they should see you right now because because you are high cotton right now. When that person said you're never going to go anywhere without me, you are calling and said, guess what, baby? Not only did I arrive, but I arrived five times since I left you. And if you get these scars by your testimonies and your witnesses about what God is doing for you. Amen. Go back. I'm not ready for that point. Go back. Go back. Go back. Go back to three. Amen. That God, that these scars are, are testimony. You should be able to say to someone, you know what? I didn't always do it right. I messed that thing up. I screwed that thing up. In fact, it wasn't the enemy. It was me because I was so greedy and so impatient. I had to have it now. And God let me have it now. And when God let me have it now, that thing almost killed me. That thing choked me around my neck, put his hands around my neck and choked me. That thing tried to hold me under the water and drown me. That thing even tried to put me in the middle of a big fire to burn me up. But each and every time it sought to take me out of here, here came God protecting me. Here came God rescuing me. Here came God renewing me. Here came God restoring me. Here came God picking me up. Here came God putting me off. Here came God doing what only he could do. You've got a, your victories are a trophy and a reminder. It's a trophy about what you've been through and what you come out of. But it's reminded of other folks to leave you to hell let me go ahead and say, there's some people that want to mess with you to see if you are what you say you are. Amen. They want to see, this is what we're talking about, didn't they? They want to see if you as as Christian as you say you are. Come on, Brother Gary. It had not been for the, the Christ in us. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. 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 Praise God. I, t I swear to God, I'm a, I'm a former law enforcement officer. As a former prosecutor, I was a law enforcement officer. So they, I had to go through training how to use a firearm. And if you mess with me, I'll put one between your head, one between your chest, and one in your foot. Just to make sure you know who you're messing with. But praise God that I'm not the same person I was when I got the gun training. But there are people, sometimes there are people that just want to test you. And sometimes they make you, they have to make you want to go back to who you were. Amen. And so that, that they, but, but what happens is God gives them some kind of indication that way said, you know, you better not mess with this one. That this one's go crazy. Amen. Now, I'm not saying I pull my gun on anyone. That's not what I'm saying. Don't walk like you're saying, Pastor, has shot someone. That's not what I'm saying. However, I've got the stance. As if I got my gun. Amen. Amen. And I'm and I, I quick to remind someone, say, you know, we can go to the gun range right now. I can show you what I'm working with. Amen. <laughs> and I can remind you of who I am and where I used to be and how quick I was to get angry at you. These are the reminders and the indicators of someone not to mess with you, to leave you alone. Some people need to know that. Some people need to Thank you, Brother Gary. Amen. Some people need to know that. God has given that to you. Like he gave David that suit of armor. So people know when they come in, don't mess with me. Amen. Leave me alone. Amen. I may be nice, but I still got some fool up in me. Okay. Amen. It's what Paul says, that there's that, there's that thorn in my side. I think that's a fool with Paul. I think Paul had to wrestle with that thing every day to say, well, you know, I want to beat you. I want to hang you. I want to murder you like I used to, but I can't. So let me wrestle with that thing over here. We don't know what that thorn is, but I think that thorn sometimes was the old Paul, the old Saul rising up in the new Paul. And he had to push that old Saul 
down. Amen. Now you get my last point. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Our victories over fear are a preview of the victories to come as we continue to walk with the Lord. Now here's the thing, and I'm through after this. When we read our scriptures, something weird happens. David has defeated Goliath. The Israelite army has gone off to chase the Philistine army back to God, and they're killing them and hurting them along the way. But we're told that Saul asks, whose son is David? And we're told he asked that while David is going to face God. You see, that, that is out of, it's out of context. The appropriate time to put that in 1 Samuel chapter 17 was back when David said, I can't wear your armor, I'm going to go with what I have, and he leaves, when it was first said, he leaves to go face uh, Goliath. That is the appropriate time for Saul to act, to put it there about Saul asking Abner, General Abner, whose son is David. But what happens, they, it, it's put at the end, it's a weird place for it to be put. And it's put there because we fast forward, we go back in time to fast forward to the present, where when David comes back with Goliath's head in his hand, King Abner brings him before Saul, and he says, uh, and Saul says, the king says to David, whose son are you? And David says, I, I, my father is Jesse, and we live in Bethlehem. Okay, you didn't get that. Let me work on that again. He, Saul wants to know whose son he is. Who does he belong to? What's his significance? What's his spiritual pedigree to, for him to be able to do what he did? He said, my father's name is Jesse, and we live in Bethlehem. Okay, you see what I Let me break this down. Let me break it down. I know y'all saying, oh, I just don't get it. I just don't get it. Okay, let me break it down. Let me break it down. Okay, okay. The word Bethlehem in Aramaic means house of bread. Okay, brother, brother Rose has got it. He just got it. He's, like, we, he's waiting for us to get it, okay? And throughout the Bible, bread means everything yes. to the Israelites. Yes. Bread, God uses bread in several different connotations, several situations. Remember when the Israelites were traveling between Egypt and the Promised Land and how God fed them? He rained manna down from heaven. Manna is nothing more than bread plates. You know those pieces that we pick off the little pick out of the basket between them bringing us a bread and our meal because we too scared to ask for another basket of bread because we don't want people around us to think that we're starving. So what we do, we uh, discreetly put our little fingertips in the bread basket and we start eating the crumbs. That's manna. God rained manna down from heaven. All right? Well, guess what? That's not the only thing. Did y'all remember Gideon? In fact, we did a sermon series on Gideon. Remember, at one point, Gideon still doesn't believe that God is with him. And so what God says to Gideon, get your armor bearer. Go with him into the camp of the Midianites. Hear how they think about you. So as Gideon sneaks into the camp of the Midianites, he hears two soldiers talking. The first soldier tells the second soldier, I had a dream. And, and the second soldier said, what about your dream? So the first soldier said, in my dream, there was a loaf of the a loaf of barley bread rolling down the side of the mountain into the camp that destroyed the tents. And the, and the second soldier said, oh, that's nothing but God. God told you that he, that he has given us into the hands of the media of Gideon. you got to understand the symbolism there. Bread rolling down a mountain. The mountain is tall. The bread is God's word about Gideon. Rolling down the mountain. The mountain represents God. The bread Yeah. 
do it once, but he did it twice. In fact, do you remember that last week for First Sunday? And during First Sunday, we had the Holy Communion service. And what's the first thing that we consumed during the Holy Communion? We consumed the bread. Because the bread was God's body broken for the remission of our sin. Y'all not getting it. Saul asked whose son you are. David replied whose son he was, but also that he's from Bethlehem, the house of bread. And from the house of bread came the living bread. Because if you remember what Jesus said, those who are hungry will eat upon the bread I give them and they will hunger no more. God, he's talking about his word. Talk about him. God is the bread. But guess what? Many of us look like, look at Bethlehem and we only worship Bethlehem at the Christmas time because that's the birth. In fact, many people said, what good comes out of Nazareth? Well, Bethlehem is in the same reason as Nazareth. What good comes out of God that said that guess what? Not only did your Savior in this moment come, but the Savior I'm sending is going to come. Now, I know you're saying, I don't see that nowhere in there. It doesn't say anything about Jesus. Pastor, you're just pulling that out of your shoe and you're just trying to do that so that you have something to hold us here in church for. That's not true. Jesus is in, for, in 1 Samuel chapter 17. Let me tell you where he is. When Saul says, what is your father's name? He said, my name is Jesse. Amen. You didn't get that one either. <laughs> the name Jesse in Aramaic is pronounced Yeshai. Okay? Jesus' name in Aramaic is pronounced Yeshua. Are you seeing it? Both Yeshai and Yeshua are derivatives of the name Yeshua. Joshua. Yes. God saves. In fact, this is the same as having Miriam, Mary, Miriam, Maribel. Uh, 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 These are all derivatives of the name Mary that we have. You know how we say Roberto, Robert, Bob, Bobby, Robbie. All the group is the same word. Amen. William, Bill, Billy, Willie. All the groups are the same name. David's father's name is a derivative of the name that means God saves. And so what David is saying to Saul, Saul wants to know who his father is. But David is really saying in spiritual language, guess what? Not only is my father named after God, and that my father's name means God saves. It's a derivative of meaning God saves. But guess what? God is going to do more than just save us from a Philistine. God is going to protect us. God is going to keep us. God is going to do an amazing work in us. He's doing it because he has put his name on us. He Amen. named the city that we live in. He named my father and the city that's coming that there's nothing that we have to worry about. And so with that said, I want First Fellowship to know right now that you should not walk out of here with not a care on your mind. I don't care if the bill collector is waiting for you at the house. I don't care if you don't know where you're going to work tomorrow. I don't care if you got to go to the doctor tomorrow. You should not have a care in your heart or your mind because guess what? God has named this city Bethlehem and our father's name is Jesse. And God has promised us that he himself will save us. He himself will come to get us. He himself will protect us. He himself will lift us up. He himself will dust us off. He himself will fight for us. He himself will make a way. He himself will open the door. He himself will do it all for us. Amen. If he would trust, operates from faith. Amen. Amen. I'm done. That's the end of the sermon. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Let's do this. Amen. As I'm trying to catch my breath here. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Woo I think the only thing that can get my breath back is a piece of fried chicken. Amen. Amen. Praise, God. Amen. Praise God. I think I'll breathe just fine. Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Let's do this. Let's have our call. Uh, our two calls. Amen. This morning. Uh,